I'm making a game which may be described as the blend of XCOM, Pokemon and Hades. For the past months I have been focusing on the former too, adding additional systems to the turn-based combat on a hexagonal grid. In the game you command a squad of primals, versatile creatures with unique abilities. The goal is not only to outmaneuver the enemies with a plethora of movement, damage and utility options, but also to craft a perfect team for the job, creating synergistic compositions based on primals' mana management and playstyle. Making, balancing and tuning those systems has taken me 7 months already, but I am finally satisfied with the outcome, which has come out as a rich and complex system. It is however only a cog in a bigger machine. Primal Frey is, and always was, supposed to be a roguelike, moving from combat to combat, getting rewards, exploring the lore of the world and planning further steps, are necessary gameplay decisions which enrich the player's experience and give him the sense of purpose. The bigger gameplay loop connects smaller elements, like glue, making the game more than a sum of its parts. At the beginning of February I decided to finally create my own Hades Unity and take a crack at crafting systems necessary to push my game from being a fighting simulator to a full-fledged video game. I am a visual-oriented developer, that means that I cannot stand Greybox substitutes for UI, put in place to focus on the systems first. I think that player experience should guide the design, so I always try to create that first, see what the player sees, and put systems in place in a way for them to be intuitive to use. That is why I have started with the background for my flying scene. Since I have flying islands in the game, I was sure that I wanted a screen to emphasize the space main character has to move through to fly between them. Meet Sky, the protagonist of the game, who will be flying between consecutive islands on a glider. This idea has been softly inspired by Darkest Dungeon 2 wagon mechanic. Because the game is difficult, it requires a lot of thinking and is quite tiring. I thought that a simple minigame of steering the glider in between fights may serve as a calmer period for the player to rest a little. I also knew there is a need for the player to choose his next destination. Roguelike games do it in different ways, providing a map, showing icons or other. Since I have a glider though, I would love Sky to be able to glide to the option player chose. You can steer the glider with WASD and choose the next destination based on proximity. So now that I have an in-between fight scene, and the way to choose next destination, I need to decide on what type of places do I wish to take the player. Options I have chosen for now are getting another primal, getting a team buff, which I will explain later, healing your team, getting this run only currency, getting keep forever currency, trading with a merchant and fighting a boss. I will talk about currencies and merchant in another video. The same goes for boss, which will take some more time to explain. So let's focus on the rewards necessary to play the game now. Recruiting a primal, getting an enchantment and healing your team. If we can do that though, we need a system to choose what type of reward should the player get. They of course should be randomized, but we need a way to control the choices player may be presented with. So I have come up with the repository I call a path data. It is quite beefy and difficult to navigate, but I may put all the information I need inside. I can decide how many different options should the player see. Probably it should be one if it's boss, but usually two or three to give the player a decision to make. I may change the probability values of each option as well as control next combat a player faces. What type of enemies may show themselves? With what probabilities? And what will be their total number? If the player gets a primal, what are the probabilities of each primal he may get? Same goes for buffs, which we will discuss in a second. What are the probabilities for different tiers of buffs? So, different strengths and rarities. I also have other options here that will differentiate the effects based on player's progress. I am dividing this sequence for each biome, so if the player goes to the nature biome as a first biome, it needs to be less difficult and the rewards have to also be smaller than if the nature biome was the third option player visited. It sounds quite complicated now, but such a system will be invaluable in the future to control the difficulty and randomness of the whole game. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's get to rewards themselves. Player will either receive a primal or an enchantment, and both of them will show after combat. I decided on three cards to choose from, hoping that it is enough to create a difficult and influential choice, but not overwhelm the player at the same time. Also, I have painted the mountains you can see in the background to create a more interesting look to the choice system. What it also allowed me to do, however, is this fancy opening screen.
Choosing next primal is a straightforward enough choice, so I won't go into details with it. The buffs, however, are a whole other kind of worms. I wanted them to change as much as possible in the game, forcing the player to switch the way his whole team plays. Take these two for example. Selfish Protector lowers the amount of shield your teammates receive, but improves your own shielding. A good candidate for that may be Lutum, as he is only able to shield himself. Here, it is a no-brainer. Faxran, on the other hand, is supposed to shield as many allies as possible, and its shield is an AoE, so you should never pick Selfish Protector with her, right? And in the middle example though, maybe Glacier, who shields a single target-friendly primal. If you take the enchantment, his own shields and tanking potential will be way bigger, but he won't be able to pull his teammates out of a pit tool so easily. Another example of an interesting enchantment may be Nature, or any other mana color, Ebon Flow. It makes all abilities of this color free to cast. It's an amazing advantage, of course. Not needing to provide mana to use abilities is a big convenience. However, it comes with a heavy cost of lowering the damage by half. Such a choice works well with expensive abilities, such as those of a Nita Rana. It can now destroy hexes each turn with the biggest obstacle, which is usually the mana cost, removed. Since the ability doesn't deal any damage, there is no downside. You can imagine though that cheap abilities or abilities that generate mana are a no-go with this buff. For the first batch of enchantments, I added a MiG 53, and there is a lot more to come. They also come in three different tiers, allowing me to control how strong of a reward the player gets. It is also randomized, of course. To show the current build of the player's team, I have also added a squad panel. All the primals with the current HP and all the enchantments are visible there. The rocks slide in and out when you open it too, which is a cool effect in my opinion. And yes, I mentioned current HP. I took a lesson from Darkest Dungeon, you see, if you know the game, you should also know that Red Hook Studio had a problem with healing strategies players used. Basically, players would lower enemy numbers to one weakest opponent, so that then they can freely top up on healing before the next encounter. To combat this boring strategy, the devs implemented round counters. After 5 rounds or so in combat, the reinforcement would arrive to aid the enemies. It resulted in a time limit of sorts forced on the players to make them kill the horrors quickly and without any cheese. I sometimes enjoy to have long and drawn out fights, and it would be difficult anyway to limit the time of a single fight in Primal Fray. That's why I have decided to not implement healing primals at all. It has been a conscious decision since the beginning. Instead, there is a shield mechanic in the game. It serves the same purpose in combat as it may mitigate the damage received, however it cannot restore primals half of lost, so there is no end game shenanigans. Because of that, there is a need for a different, not abusable healing mechanic in the game. I decided on a simple 50% whole team healing encounter for now. It is an encounter which is frequency of occurrence will affect the game's difficulty the most. The game is difficult and players will long and look forward to those healing islands. If someone preserves his primals well by playing smart, he may be able to risk choosing a different reward now than again. By omitting the healing islands, you get more rewards of other types, if you survive that is. One more thing I knew I had to add was a tutorial. This game is getting more complicated by the minute and there needs to be a way to introduce new players to the mechanics. What I haven't thought of though is the fact that if I want to teach the player how to fight, I will probably have to do it with a single primal only, to lower the scale of the whole ordeal. That means that enemies should be weaker than that. But how can I make them weaker than a single unit? Because of that, I needed units with strength comparable to that of half a primal. That's how those bots came to be. One is a gunner bot and the other is a jouster. They came out quite cute and I very much enjoyed them. There are not primals, but robots will have their own significance in the rift as well. They are not as important and there won't be a whole robot tribe or something, but they are a perfect subject for an onboarding experience. There will also be a robot boss, but you will have to wait to the next video for that. Subscribe if you don't want to miss it. So there is quite a lot of roguelike already in the game. There are destinations to choose from, different rewards, safe spots, and death. What is missing, however, is a sense of a deeper purpose. A hint of an exploration, 
a part of the game that will soften the devs blow. Fortunately, there is just a thing I may steal. Uh, I mean copy, uh, I mean get inspired about. You absolutely cannot tell me that you didn't fall in love with Hades' characters. The roguelike loop of meeting the same person over and over and over again works great with the way the game tells its story. There is always another interaction to be had and another trivia to be learned about the underworld. I fell in love with this storytelling way and I wanted to do a similar thing. It would be a pity if the devs behind Hades revealed all their secrets in a GDC talk, now wouldn't it? I do not hide the fact that I was heavily inspired by Supergiant games, but I am a single person and therefore I have to search for shortcuts where a bigger team may afford to experiment. I have a story and quite a lot of lore prepared for Primal Fray. After so many months, I may finally start telling it. You play a Sky, a teenage boy who steers his glider into what's called a rift. It's a physical anomaly of unknown origin, which not only makes islands levitate and defy gravity, but also changes the space inside, creating primordial creatures people call primals. There have been trials to harvest the energy of the rift, but they all have failed in the past, leaving their equipment and robots never recovered by electrical corporations. Sky is aided by Blossom, his older sister, who despite not entering the rift, supports him with her wits and knowledge. Siblings together plan expeditions into the rift, looking for their long-gone father, a scientist who entered the rift for study and never came back. I think such a teaser may do for now, and hopefully you may see why the dialogue system is a perfect way to explore this story further. Every time Sky encounters the same character in the rift, no matter a merchant, primal or a boss, he may have another conversation with them, getting to know new stuff and drawing conclusions while bantering with his sister in an earpiece. Recruiting new primals is then a perfect opportunity for me to show their different characters, ways of thinking and tempers. New lore hiding behind every corner will hopefully motivate the players to explore the world of Primal Fray, as well as loosen a fear of loss a little, as each death will also push the story forward. With the dialogues done, we have reached all that I managed to do through February. <sighs> I am honestly surprised with how much content it is possible to do in one month. Also, really shows that the meat and bones of the game, so the core gameplay is the real time consumer. I haven't managed to squeeze in the merchant or a boss for now, but you may expect them in the next videos. I am going with the build you are seeing now to the Warsaw GDC convent and will test how well it is received by the players there. Summing up, the game is really got it rounded up. I think that two thirds of the systems are done, even if I am still missing most of the content. If you want to play this build, it is available on the game's Patreon for $3 to keep forever. If you want to see the game come out, it is the best way to support it as whole money I get there will pay musicians and other artists I may outsource work to. Also, if you want to see how AI works in video games and how to start making it yourself, you may check out the video visible on the screen right now.